Good morning. Good morning. It's an honor and privilege to stand here before you today. And it's uh, wonderful to be able to share with you the opportunity that we had a couple of months ago in our travel. I will be mixing uh, photos, historical facts, and the Bible. Uh, when Daniel, through his vision from God, interpreted the dream of Nebuchadnezzar's great statue, he probably saw more than he could understand or record at that time. Because the fulfillment of, of Nebuchadnezzar's dream, particularly the fourth kingdom, or the Roman Empire, was about 500 years ahead of Daniel's time and beyond his technological understanding to describe what he was shown by God. Legend has it that Romulus and his twin brother Remus, apparent sons of uh, the god Mars, were suckled by a she-wolf after being abandoned. Upon adulthood, they decided to build a city. The brothers argued and Romulus killed Remus and then named the city at Rome after himself. This was supposedly the beginning of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire has been in existence since 753 BC. Now the siege of Babylon, when Daniel and his three friends were captured, happened around um, 605 BC. And it was not until 31 BC when Augustus Caesar, also known as Julius Caesar, became the dictator of Rome. And that's the beginning of Rome's world power. As a sequel to, um, oh, it was not until 476 AD that the emperor of Rome, Romulus Augustus, Augustulus, was deposed or um, removed from power. And that was the end of the Roman rule, ending a 500 year um, rule. As a sequel to our travel in Israel a year and a half ago, my purpose in going to Rome was to see with my own eyes the historic greatness of this ancient city and to understand why it became a world power and to look for reasons as to what drove them to behave the way they did. They were known as delighting in acts of violence and the spilling of blood. And um, I, how could that be Christian? As so they claim. As I look at the ruins or what was left of the grandeur of the city, the museums, the artwork, the architecture, I learned more than I bargained for. Let us pray. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Let's go back to the text there. Daniel 2.40, and the fourth kingdom shall be as strong as iron, inasmuch as iron breaks in pieces and shatters everything, and like iron that crushes, that kingdom will break in pieces and crush all the others. Gives you, it, it, it exudes strength, right? Rome, the fourth kingdom, the legs of iron. The idiom uh, to rule with an iron fist applies to ancient Rome. The empire that ruled with immense and absolute power, strength and blood. From the time Jesus was born to his, throughout Jesus' ministry, through his resurrection and his ascension to heaven, Rome was in power. And just like Israel in modern times, Rome is a mixture of modern and ancient buildings uh, where the buildings were um, broken down or they went into ruin, then they were rebuilt broke down and rebuilt, vandalized and rebuilt again. But um, it's amazing how they were able to create uh, such wonderful ar architecture and stuff without the modern things that we have today, without the machines that we have today. Everything was done by hand. I took about 600 pictures, but I'm going to show you only about 90 today. <laughs> Don't worry. Otherwise, we'll be here forever. And some of the obvious ones are not mine. I didn't take them, like the pictures of ancient emperors and ancient popes, because I never met them. The dates written here are the dates of the reign as emperor or the pope. 
during its reign, as you can see, that the Roman Empire covers a much bigger territory. Parts of Europe, Britain, North Africa, the Middle East, all the countries surrounding the Mediterranean Sea. This was the Roman power during that time. And just like um, any other ancient um, city in Rome, it was surrounded by thick wall to protect the people, the monarch, the pope from attacking barbarians. We cannot escape talking about Rome without talking about the emperors and the papacy. So I will be presenting some of the popes that were significant to the historical development of the empire and also significant to us as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. This is not to exalt or to insult them, but this is to put history and the Bible together and just to present facts connecting all the, the events that transpired. And some of the, uh, the references I checked were from the Catholic references. So this is what remains of the second wall. This is the second wall that was erected. This is called the Aurelian Wall. This was built around 271 to 275 AD. This is what's left of it. It used to be about 12 miles. And it's constructed of brick phase concrete, um, volcanic rocks and ashes. From outside the city, we drove along the longest road called the Via Aurelia Antarctica through one of the ancient gates called the Ark of Fontana Paula. And this leads us to the ancient Roman Empire, or more specifically, the Vatican. So we crossed the Fiume River, uh, Fiume Tevere, or the Tiber River, through the Ponte Vittorio Emanuel. This is the bridge dedicated, and we'll come back to, his, to this person, to Vittorio Emanuele, a little bit later on. And this is one of the 24 bridges or so um, spanning the Tiber River. Our first stop, the Vatican, the seat of Catholic uh, Christendom, the seat of power in ancient times as well as today. The, we have here, this is St. Peter's Square, I think, yeah. St. Peter's Square, and we have the St. Peter's Basilica, the Sistine Chapel, the Colonnade, the Obelisk, and the two fountains. The current Pope, Pope Francis, is the 266th Pope. So you can imagine how long the papacy has existed. Can you guess who the first Pope was? Oh, I'm sorry, and this is the papal window from where the Pope usually appears, where uh, announcements are made. Yes, none other than Peter, the Catholics consider him the first pope. The whole Vatican actually is a memorial to Peter because of this text. Well, Mike. Peter, and I will build my church on this rock. The power of death will not be able to defeat my church. I will give you the keys to God's kingdom. When you speak judgment here on earth, that judgment will be God's judgment. When you promise forgiveness here on earth, that forgiveness will be God's forgiveness. Amen. Thank you. We will not discuss the difference between symbolism and realism today, but I encourage you to do your own Bible readings and research, just exactly what Jesus meant by this. Please note that he said the keys to the kingdom of heaven, not the keys to heaven. Unlike Israel, where the scholars of the Bible were archaeologists, scientists, the churches convened together to agree on the sacred places. The churches here in Rome were built not on biblical uh, references, but on tradition. Although there's no evidence in the Bible that Peter ever set foot in Rome, he did lead the disciples, and he was in ministry for 34 years the longest reigning pope, if you want to use that term. And according to the papal calendar, he uh, was there from 33 after Jesus went to heaven to 66 AD. This is the obelisk. Tradition, and I'll use the, uh, I believe, is that this is the place where Peter was crucified upside down. Again, the Bible does not mention that Peter ever set foot in Rome. Again, tradition says this is where he was um, crucified. And it was placed there as a, as a memorial to the death of Peter. And, um, and to balance death with life, 
they uh, built two fountains. The first, the Moderna fountain was built in 1641 on the left side of the obelisk when you're facing the, the basilica. And the Bernini fountain was built some 25 to 26 years later, and this one is on the right side of the obelisk. It was such so an awe-inspiring uh, experience to just look around and take all these pictures and take in the sight. I mean, I could never describe. As at around the time when Martin Luther King nailed his 95 thesis on the door of, of the Wittenberg Castle Church in Germany, Pope Leo X claimed that the indulgences will be granted to those who contributed or donated to the building of St. Peter's in Basilica. In other words, he said you can buy salvation. Martin Luther's 95 Thesis condemned the selling of indulgences, and this was the commencement of the Reformation. He eventually was excommunicated from the Catholic Church, but the Protestantism, Protestantism expanded out of his teachings. From the Old Testament, Psalms, Isaiah, Habakkuk, to name a few, all the way to the New Testament, from Acts all the way to the end of the Bible, declares that there is only one way to salvation, and that is through the grace of Jesus Christ and accepting him by faith. And I chose one of these texts. Patricia? First Thessalonians 5, 9, 11. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Amen. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. Thank you. That's very clear. Enough said. This is the colonnade. It's a building of columns, four deep, for each row. And on top of each one of them are, stand the statues of the canonized saints and those who were martyred for the sake of their beliefs. A total of 140 saints. And at the center of the Vatican is, of course, the St. Peter's Basilica. This is one of the largest churches in the world and always well attended. The Catholic tradition holds that this is the burial place of Peter. He is supposedly buried inside the church under the high altar. When we went there, it was the day after um, Easter. So the whole uh, square was filled with chairs and a mass just transpired the day before. Inside the basilica are, is the most um, famous of all sculpture of Michelangelo, the Pieta. This shows the larger than life sculpture of Jesus upon his removal from the cross being cradled by Mary, his mother. The sculpture is encased in glass so you cannot touch it and you cannot vandalize it. There are other paintings and murals that are so numerous. On another day, I would like to show you more pictures, maybe during one of our uh, movie nights. This is just some of the uh, sculptures and um, tapestry, frescoes, and the paintings and the ceiling inside. The tourists are allowed to enter and admire and take pictures of the inside while the mass service is going on. And why? I asked that question myself. They, I figured they should stop when the mass is going on, but they keep it going. And they think throng of people you're trying to gain footing there so you don't fall over it was very difficult to be very quiet cameras were snapping and voices were commenting and um and i was wondering why this was allowed to the detriment of the worshipers uh, side comment here each one of these tourists paid 15 euro to enter the basilica except those who are disabled and the companions of disabled. So we got to go in for free. <laughs> Adjacent to the um, Basilica is the Musei Vaticani, or the Vatican Museum. Again, it's mostly religious paintings, sculptures, tapestries, frescoes from the ancient Baroque to Renaissance, classical, romantic eras. And there are also um, 
statues of Roman and Greek um, gods. Here, I just chose some pictures for you to see, but I took hundreds of them. And this is just an example of the intricate work of the vest of a Roman soldier. And that they take all that, they take the, the, the time to really car carve all these things. And on the right side is the gold and the silver demonstrating the wealth of, of the Vatican. And there are a total of uh, 54 galleries, but the most popular or the most famous of all galleries is the Sistine Chapel. The, um, the <coughs> between, it was built between 1475 and 1481 and commissioned by Pope Sixtus IV. It's called the Capella Magna or the Chapel of Chapels, built by Giovanni di Dolci. Today, it is a place where the bishops meet to elect the new pope. The chief attraction of the Sistine Chapel are the frescoes or the murals painted on the ceiling and along the sides. There's just too many of them. Every corner, every nook is filled with paintings and frescoes. And they were built by several artists between 1481 to 1483. But it was not until um, 1503 to 1513 that Pope Julius II established the Vatican Museum and commissioned Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. And this is what people flock in there to see. And it, he painted this between 1508 to 1512. Taking pictures in the Sistine Chapel was forbidden. So actually, I pulled this from the internet. Of course, some tourists are wise, they, they click and then they apologize later. But there are several guards there to, to watch to make sure you do not take pictures to preserve the holiness of the place. And you know, you, you just need to respect that. So um, you will need at least a couple of hours just to sit there and look and admire and understand and to contemplate and to pray about those, you know. Even though it's a Catholic church, you still, you still feel like meditating when you're inside the Sistine Chapel. Um, let me warn you before I show you the next picture. Nudity is the art of the day during that time. During the Renaissance period, and artists, it's because artists are challenged to paint the intricacies of the, the human body. And um, unlike today, we do not want something like that inside a church. We will consider it pornography, but at that, that time, it was the beauty and the, um, the, the meditation uh, and the, uh, the artwork of the day. At the very center of Michelangelo's painting is the most famous fresco of all, the creation of Adam. You've probably seen a lot of these uh, pictures. Um, now, there are nine episodes uh, major episodes are taken from Genesis and the rest of the, um, on the sides and the, and the back artist. And uh, again, I can show them to you at a later date. The back wall, so I'm showing you the very, very center of the ceiling. And if you go to the back wall, it's the largest of all murals. It covers the whole wall. Remember, I didn't take these pictures because I couldn't. I pulled it out from the, um, from the internet. The back wall Michelangelo painted some 25 years later, between 1536 and 1541, and it was commissioned by Pope Paul III, and it's called The Last Judgment. The mission of the Vatican Museum is that of evangelization, just like all other religions. Now, we may not agree with the Catholic doctrines in the manner of evangelization, but I would dare say that their mission is the same as all other Christian religions. On the western side, on the western part of Rome, outside the wall, is one of the seven hills, or one of the many hills, the Geniculum Hill. If you go up there, it's just breathtaking. You find 360 degrees of the panoramic view of Rome. I did not capture all, but here are some pictures. I went north, south, east, west. 
I can't remember which one is north and which one is south, but this is some of the things you can see standing up on top of the hill. And I believe this is the American, that one I believe is the American Academy in, in Rome. Geniculum is the site of a battle in 1849 between the forces of Garibaldi and the defending a revolutionary Rome Republic. This was when Garibaldi was trying to unite all of Italy and to remove Rome and the Pope from power. Pope Pius at that time, Pope Pius IX was the longest reigning Pope. This is the, this is the statue of Garibaldi on top of Janiculum Hill. Pope Pius IX was the uh, longest reigning Pope aside from Peter. 31 years, and history in history and the greatest, the great antagonist of Italian unity. He didn't want the um, Italy to be united. He wanted Rome to remain in power. During his reign, their firing squads and scaffolds and guillotines were kept busy uh, to punish the revolutionists. And he would not allow any railroads to be built in Paris. Some religions consider him a, a fulfillment of uh, Daniel 7 and Revelation 13 because the statement of the papal infallibility came from this pope. His, he believes that because of, um, because of Peter, what Jesus told Peter, that the pope cannot be wrong. The pope cannot make a mistake. Glenn, let's read. Um, Daniel 7, verse 25. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High. Nevertheless, Pope Pius was defeated by Garibaldi, and in 1870, Italy was united, and Rome um, ceased from being, uh, again, for the second time, for the nth time, ceased from being a... Uh, a power. This is the Vatican City today. Compared to the map I showed you earlier, this is all that's left of the, the Vatican um, City today. The uh, Colosseum. This is uh, another. Um, to me, it's it's it's. It's just amazing to stand there inside. It's officially known as the Flavian Amphitheater. That's their spelling, not mine. Derived from the classical colossal bronze statue of Emperor Nero, uh, the sun god, who stood near the amphitheater. Located just near the Eastern Roman Forum, the Colosseum is a massive stone amphitheater. It's commissioned around AD 70 to 72 by Emperor Vespasian of the Flavian dynasty as a gift to the Roman people. He believed that if the people are well, well fed and well entertained, they are less likely to rebel against the emperor. As you enter the Colosseum, you enter through the Ark of Constantine. Is this name familiar to some of you? It's a very, uh, we'll go back to him a little bit later. The building's dimension is massive. I, this is an artist's conception of what it might have looked during that time, because today it is in ruins. It's as big as a football stadium, because it is indeed the football stadium at that time. And um, it's, it's built again from volcanic uh, rock and ashes, it can hold more than 50,000 people at any given time. And they enter through 80 entrances. The amazing thing is each person or each class of person know where to go and know where to sit. And um, it was built not only to entertain people, but also to um, honor those who are martyred in this area. Above the arena, this is the entrance to, to the arena. It's the cross that was built to. This is the cross that was built to honor those who were martyred. And 
on the top. There are four floors. I cannot imagine 80, 80, 70. What kind of, of um, tools they had during this time to be able to build four floors of stadium. You can marvel at the power, the intelligence of the Roman people at that time. And um, yeah, so anyway, um, the, the, you have four floors there, you can see it. The upper floors are for the lower class and the women. And the lowest floor are for the prominent people and the rich. So the bleachers today and the box seats, I think that's what you would call it. Anyway, and it's covered by, um, hold on, the, the, the lower floor, the ground floor, you have the cages and the places where they keep the wild animals. Not only lions and bears and tigers, they had elephants and crocodiles as well. I didn't know that up to, until I um, went there. And here's another marvel of Roman architecture and ingenuity. There are lifts or elevator where the animals can go and they can be lifted up into the arena. So you will never see them and they will never let them loose until it's time for their show. And there are passageway where they can go through this uh, labyrinth, if you want to call it. The Colosseum is covered with a huge awning called the Velarium. Today, even our football stadiums don't have this, and the people are exposed to rain and sun. This is to protect the spectators from the sun. In uh, AD 80, the Spassian sun, Titus opened the Colosseum with 100 days of games. And what are those games? Today, if we have a sports game, football, basketball, we, we enjoy that. Hopefully, there's no blood or broken bones. But this is uh, our sports of today. This is their sports of yesterday, blood games. Form, that's their form of entertainment. A day at the arena might look like this. In the morning, you have gladiator fights, the slaves and those, the criminals. Those are uh, sentenced to death anyway. They fight to the death, followed by uh, avenatio or wild animal hunts. They either uh, let the wild animals fight each other until uh, they all die, or they pick a prey and the animals hunt this prey until that prey is killed. Lunchtime, they eat lunch and watch public executions. The criminals, convicts, hanging, beheading, crucifixion, feeding of wild animals. This includes Christians, and some of the popes were martyred as well. About twice a year, they have the Numaki, a naval combat. They fill the arena with water from the ocean through the aqueduct, and they demonstrate naval battle. Can we even do that to our football stadiums today? But such the, the, the intelligence of the architecture. But such horrible games they watch. And they cheer and they, you know, just like we cheer today for the athletes. And this is how they did it. The Christians who died for their faith can only claim this promise. Oops, oh, before we go there, um, this is the um, quarters of the gladiators. And then they go up to their doom into the arena. Oh, and with them, the, um, they're trying to repair part of the Colosseum so you can see the, the ancient and the modern. So let's go back to the um, text at the end now. 2 Timothy. Ele verses 11 to 13. This is a faithful saying. For if we died with him, we also shall live with him. Amen. If we endure, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. Amen. Let's go back to Constantine the Great. I call him the compromiser. 
because he compromised himself by combining pagan and Christian beliefs and redefined Christianity. Apparently, he had a dream, and he saw a flaming cross in the sky bearing the words, In this sign thou shalt conquer. In 312 AD, he converted to Christianity, although more, most people questioned the true nature of his faith because he was a sun worshiper. Although he professed to conversion to Christianity, in his heart he remained devoted to the sun, believing that the sun was universally celebrated as the invincible guide and protector. He also changed the day of rest from Sabbath to Sunday. He created the earliest Sunday law known in history in 321 AD. To, um, together with the Emperor Linicius of the Eastern Power, he signed the Treaty of Milan, and he established by, by um, putting together the pagan sign and the Christian, he established also the freedom of worship. The reigning pope at that time, Pope Miltiades, ended the persecution of the Christians. They even elected Christians to government position. And Constantine established his capital in Constantinople, now Istanbul in Turkey. He says in history that by dividing the capital, the power of the Roman Empire started to decline. Decades later, in 380, Theodosius I declared this compromised Christianity, as they see fit at that time, as the official religion of the Roman Empire. Let us finish the previous text, Glenn. He shall speak pompous words against the Most High, shall persecute the saints of the Most High, and shall intend to change times and law. This, em this emperor and the popes, they fulfilled that prophecy. Going back to the modern times, this is Trastevere, established in um, 509, uh, I mean, um, no, 753 until 509. It was inhabited by the Etruscans until Rome conquered it in 509 BC. So we're going back BC, so that they can control access to both uh, um, sides of the Tiber River. Today, it's a busy area for tourists and a hot spot, lots of pubs and uh, restaurants. And uh, the narrow cobbled streets remain. It's really an intricate way. Also in Trastevere is the Jewish ghetto. In 1555, Pope Paul IV, in order to contain the Jews, because the Jews are prone to rebellion, and we know that if you remember Barabbas, from time immemorial, the Jews were always rebelling against government and administration. So could, to contain them, he put them all in one place and he built a wall around them. Today, the wall is broken, and uh, this is what is left of the wall. This is the Ark of, um, this is the Ark. <laughs> and there is a church there. If you notice to the right side, there's a church there because they continuously try to convert the Jews into Christianity. As you walk along the cobbled streets, and uh, that's the church, and this is a detailed work of the ark, and uh, you can see it's really amazing, the um, sculpture, how they're able to do this with simple tools. No computer, no machine, just simply by hand. Oh, by the way, this one's for sale, if anyone is interested. And these are other buildings, modern and ancient buildings side by side. You can still get a delicious gelato right there at the, in the Jewish ghetto. And another side uh, comment, this is, um, um, this is the Cobble Street. Um, the Jewish, and this is the Jewish museum inside the Jewish ghetto. To demonstrate to you the wealth, these are their gold and silver and crown. There are a lot more pictures I took. I can show it to you on another day. Side comment, this is just tr traffic of uh, Rome, <laughs> the city of Rome. You can see they can park any way they want as long as they can fit their car in there. 
we were riding a Toyota Yaris. You know how small that is here, but a Toyota Yaris is a mid-sized sedan in the streets of Rome. And that one on top, I don't even know what car that is, but it's the smallest I've ever seen in my whole life. We don't have it here. I don't think it'll survive. No, it's smaller than a smart car. The smart car is the standard. The smart car is the standard car there. Fiat, Renault, Estro One. Once in a while, you'll see an Alfa Romero. But I've never seen that smaller than a smart car. Well, that was a side comment. Let's go back. And um, these are the typical houses, just like in Israel. They start with one floor. A family, as the eldest son gets married, they build a second floor. When the next child gets married, they build another floor. So you know, these houses have at least two married children on top of their um, original house. This is a thin crust pizza. That is the original pizza. Pizza do not they don't have thin, they don't have thick crust like we do here because we love the carbs. They have very thin crust but very sturdy. And the one on the right is adobo with noodles. They call pancit. Let's go back. This is the pyramid of Caesarus. I can't even pray. Ep Ep Epilonius. Who was he? He was a nobody except for the fact that he was rich. And the pyramids during that time, it was like fashionable to bring artifacts from Egypt or to build your, um, your tomb like Egypt because this is a time when Rome, the Roman Empire just captured Egypt. So it's like the, the spoils of Egypt. So he was a, really a nobody but a rich person and he can do whatever he wants because he can afford it. Now this is there because to the right side of it, is the um, gate of Paul. This is part of the, uh, the right side, part of the Aurelian wall, and this is the biggest gate and the best preserved gate of all. Catholic tradition declared that Paul, the apostle, was taken outside of Rome through this gate, bound in chains, and to about two miles to his execution. The first chapter, who was Paul? Why was he not considered a pope? Because he wasn't. But who was Paul really? Let's read from the first chapter in Romans. Uh, Teresa. Romans 1, 1 to 6. Paul, a band servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Through him, we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are called of Jesus Christ. Paul was the real missionary and the evangelist of Rome, but for whatever reason, he was not considered a pope. Okay, this is the Museo de la Via Ostiense. This is on top of the gate of Rome. At uh, this time, the display, when we went there, the display was very sparse. They only had a few um, statues, a few um, sculptures. One room was virtually empty, and one room had only um, murals on the wall. This is St. Paul's Basilica. Um, Tradition believed that through the gate, he went about two miles. This is the place where Paul was executed. But unfortunately, he still has to share this basilica with Peter. Outside the basilica are the two murals. Peter is on the left. Can you note what he is holding? Paul is on the right, holding a sword. Tradition says that after Paul's execution, his followers built a marker above the area 
which is supposedly this area where this basilica now stands. This was built also by Constantine the Great, if you remember him, but it was developed and improved throughout the years. At the center of, of the courtyard is this imposing statue of Paul. And uh, on the wall by the basilica itself, again, is Peter. You know it's Peter because he has a key on his hand, and Paul because he has a sword on his hand. And this is the colonnade outside framing the basilica, just like they had the colonnade framing St. Peter's um, uh, Basilica. Outside the colonnade, uh, again, intricate artwork on top and bottom. But if you look up at the ceiling, you can see the names of the 12 disciples. I only took the pictures of um, the markers of Peter and Andrew. The Pauline door, um, they call it. Oh, this is the inside. This is the ceiling. The Pauline door, they call it the main highlight of Paul's life, his conversion. Um, right here, when he fell off the horse, his ministry, and his um, execution or his beheading. Today, people believe, tradition believes that Paul's remains minus his head. And this uh, sarcophagus, um, this is the inside behind the altar. This is their sarcophagus or Paul's coffin, tradition says. And on the right is the chain, only nine links are left that bound him from the gate when he was captured to his execution. Inside, along the walls, and everywhere else, uh, this is the um, uh, uh, bigger view, uh, where you, so you can see where the chains and the sarcophagus are located. Uh, the ceiling and on the side, everywhere are paintings and murals. Again, just, just Getting up there, I think it's an ordeal. How much more to have to stay there for days, years to paint the, the artwork. Um, also along the wall, there are the, the pictures. Um, this is the high altar. Pictures of all the 266 uh, popes. There is so much more of uh, Rome to see. The forums. Uh, more arches, more gates, basilicas, etc. But I focus to present on what I believe is significant to us in our travel as Seventh-day Adventist Christians. As the prophecies in Daniel and Revelations were foretold and fulfilled and continues to be fulfilled, we look at ourselves as we continue with our walk as Christians. Who do we rely on? Government power, church power, reading, watching the events unfold, how do we prepare ourselves for what is yet to come? I remember a Pastor Jim's comment long time ago. Plan your life like he is coming in a hundred years, but live your life like he is coming today. What will save us is not no one else. No one person can save us from eternal doom other than the grace of Jesus Christ that is given freely to us and to those who accept him by faith. Each one of us must grow in relationship with Christ. Let us repeat our text that we um, read earlier, Ati Edna, I mean Ati Elena. Let us repeat the text that we read because it's a very important text. Uh, at Elena. For God did not appoint us to rob, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. How many more years do we have to live on this earth? And what do we focus on while we yet still live and yet not return? Pray, meditate, read the Bible, trust in the divine power. Marilyn. Commit 
read the amplified version as well because it and commit your works to the Lord, submit and trust them to Him, and your plans and your plans will succeed if you respond to His will and guidance. Amen. Here's another text I will Minda. It's very important. But ye beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Ask yourself today, how can I improve my personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Some people think they're long gone and God will never forgive him. But it's never too late. He will always love us and is always waiting for our response. Renee? Revelations 3, 19 through 21. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Amen. Amen. God is calling us today. Popular answer B. Let us sing a song of consecration and really mean it. Not with sadness, but with <clears throat> conviction and determination in getting to know him. 